Hello and welcome to episode 3 of season 13 of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Tuesday the 7th of April. I'm joined by my faithful comrades Alan Pope and Martin Wimpress. Hello fellas. Hello Mark. Hello, how are you? Uh, yeah, you know, getting there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in this week's episode, we are going to be talking about some community news and events, and we all have a couple of news headlines thrown in there for good luck. So, Martin, what have you been doing in the past couple of weeks? Uh, mostly, I have been preparing beta releases of Ubuntu. Oh, we should probably have a bit of a chat about them, given that we're the Ubuntu podcast, shouldn't Maybe we? Maybe we'll do that in a bit, yes. Yes. All right, then. We'll, we'll we'll come back round to that. In the meantime, Alan, what have you been doing? So a while back, I decided I would create a wiki, my own personal wiki. And uh, I have been using it to keep notes of stuff. And one of the things I decided to keep notes of is my own hardware. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I did this because I was in uh, an, a Telegram channel and some guy linked to a wiki page and it turned out to be his own personal wiki where he listed all his hardware and, you know, what was installed on it and what he used. Because people sometimes ask you when you're like talking to other nerds, they say, oh, what, what are you running on that particular machine or what distro are you running or something like that? Or what, what spec is it or something? And rather than answer them like a normal human being, I can just give them a link <laughs> to a page. <laughs> <laughs> so read it here <laughs> because i get asked this question all the time you know, i'm walking down the street and well not anymore and, you, and you've got so many think pads you can't possibly remember them all well there is that yes so i've started auditing my think pads um and first of all i had them all mixed in with all my other machines and i put them in order of which was the uh most powerful machine and so i had the most powerful machine at the top or the daily use machine at the top and now I've decided, no, I'll break out all the ThinkPads into their own category on the wiki. And then within that, I'll sort by date order. So now in reverse chronological order, I've got listed all of the ThinkPads I own. Well, most is of that them. Cro- is that chronological order that they were made or that you got them? It's the manufacture date, yes. Uh, so going back, I think 18 years uh, is the oldest uh, ThinkPad I have, which is quite crusty. Uh, but still works. All of them still work, bar one, I think, or well, two. Can you do anything useful with an 18-year-old ThinkPad? Uh, yes, uh, because most of them, if if they're that old, they'll run DOS or Windows 98, and there's plenty of old retro games that don't require an internet connection and work on low-spec hardware with no problems at all. And so they're really good for retro gaming on the genuine hardware. You get the real feel that you don't get in an emulator like DOSBox. Like, DOSBox is great, but it's not the same. I do have one game in particular which I can't run on modern machines. It actually has to run on old Windows 98. If I try and run it in VirtualBox or something like that, it messes up. And I think the physics of the game are tied to the frame rate. And so if the frame rate's too high uh, because the VM is too powerful, it then completely messes up the gameplay and it doesn't work. Yeah, Excellent. I was just I was just wondering what sound card you have in your 18-year-old ThinkPad because I'm looking up here at my box of old games and I have the original Wing Commander, Wing Commander 2 on floppy disks and like Mark describes, they only work on real hardware properly. So uh, maybe you could, uh, you know, clean it up, sanitise the keyboard for me and I could have a lend. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are normal computers and you can plug an external keyboard into them, Martin. You, well, that would be fine. That. If you, if you yes. shrink, wrap it, shrink wrap it, then we could do that. <laughs> I, I'm just stroking one of my ThinkPads here because I don't want her to hear these horrible words you're saying about her. <laughs> I'm not saying horrible words. I was I, I was finding use for it, but I I am wondering. You know, the only reason that people stop and ask you about your ThinkPads is because you wear that T-shirt, which is "Ask me about my ThinkPads" written on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. There'll be a link to my audit in the web, in the uh, show notes. <laughs> but of course, they will. Oh dear! I think we better move on to some community news. A 
And now it's time for some community news. And we've got quite a lot of community news this week because Ubuntu things have been happening in droves. So, Martin, do you want to take it away with our first Ubuntu release notes yes. for the upcoming 2004 LTS Focal Fusa release? Yes, it's the Focal Fusa. Come on, everyone. It's the Focal Fusa. So no, I'm not on board <laughs> with that at all. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. Anyway, so we've had the uh, beta release of Ubuntu Focal Fusa. Is it a Focal Fusa? A Focal Fusa. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, obviously, all of the additions, so, you know, server and what have you. But here we're going to be talking about the desktop because that's what we care most about. And uh, that has shipped with GNOME uh, 3.36. Okay. What's new in GNOME 3.36 there's stuff that that um sort of ubuntu has been contributing to and ubuntu users have been looking for or is it just a sort of pulling from upstream kind of thing yeah there's a bunch of stuff obviously we uh you know stand on the shoulders of giants with everything that goes on in upstream but of course we represent part of that upstream effort so we've been working on the stuff that you know our users and customers tell us they care most about so we've been contributing that stuff alongside you know all of the other work that goes on from the everyone else that builds on top of gnome as well but it's you know widely reported now that daniel van vogt from the ubuntu desktop team has been doing loads of work in well for about the last year and a half around smoothing out the performance and lowering the cpu usage of gnome and um another round of those improvements have landed in gnome 3 336 and uh you can really tell the difference in this one more so than you could in 1910 it's funny i anecdotally you know you hear other people say it's faster and i you know I, I it feels faster but i have no performance metrics it's not like i can run foronix desk suite which like tests gpu performance and tests games you know frame rates and stuff there's i don't know that there's anything i can do that objectively says to me this is drawing better than it did on the previous release it just feels better and i mm. i feel like i feel like it's a cheat but it is. It is. It does feel faster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, Daniel did a lightning talk at a sprint a little while ago where he actually explained how he measured this stuff in order to prove the changes he was making did lower latency and all the rest of it. Um, but you have to, you know, pull out some pretty extreme debugging capabilities in order to objectively mm. prove it's better. What else is new? Uh, well, uh, we've turned on the UI controls to enable X11 fractional scaling now. So if you've got some of the Ultrabooks that where, you know, 100% is just a bit too small and 200% is a bit too big, you can now enable this feature and choose maybe 125, 150, 175%. The Goldilocks uh, button. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, but I think the things that everyone are going to see most visibly is there's a new graphical boot splash and a refreshed Yeru theme, which I think those two together look absolutely fantastic. So the graphical boot splash is like dark with a cool. spinny and an Ubuntu logo and it's it's supposed to be flicker free boot, isn't it? From it, all the way yes. from Grub to GDM. That's right. Yeah. So it the uh, operates if you've ever booted you know windows 10 on a, a reasonably modern laptop and seen how it keeps the sort of the vendor uh, logo in place and then puts the spinner and the windows pieces in it it behaves much like that but where nice. you get prompted to do things like enter your passphrase for full disk encryption all of that is themed and styled the same way as the Yuru desktop. And the spinner that runs is uh, an enlarged version oh. of the spinner in the desktop as well. So there's sort of complete continuity of uh, visual language there. And we were we had a catch-up call with the Yuru team last night. And Frederick from the Yuru team was telling us about how over many hours he had painstakingly been rotating this spinner through like, you know, 0.3 of a degree, 0.3 of a degree in order to generate these animations. So lots of uh, blood, sweat and tears has gone into the visual improvements there. 
Well, of course, uh, Ubuntu isn't the only flavor that's uh, got an upcoming release. So, Alan, do you want to tell us about what's coming up in Lubuntu 2004? So there's not a lot in the release notes for Lubuntu, uh, but it is the first LTS release with the LXQt desktop. So ah. previously it was LXDE uh, that yes. was the default desktop in, in Lubuntu, and now it's LXQt, which has seen quite a lot of uh, positive comment I've seen online. People seem to like it, which is good. I, I've only tested it in terms of boot it, install it, uh, check that it works, and then format it and install something else over the top so i haven't really had a chance to play with it very much i do have some older computers that maybe it will be suitable to run on <laughs> um, i may have mentioned these in the past uh so <laughs> is that still an objective of lubuntu to target older machines i don't think so but it is pretty lean right uh mm. as as desktops go it's not super chunky um although you know people tell me these days that kde plasma is not as chunky as it used to be and so that's pretty um sprightly and can run on older hardware so i haven't done a direct comparison but yeah lubuntu seems like a good candidate for uh slightly older machines cool well speaking of kde plasma uh kubuntu is also uh it's now had its uh, beta release for 2004 um and uh, pretty much as you'd expect the um the highlights of the new Kubuntu release are new KDE Plasma from Upstream and the new KDE app suite. Um, it's now running Plasma 5, uh, which means that uh, KDE 4 and Plasma 4 have now been deprecated and removed from the archive for this release. Um, and also the there is a Plasma Wayland session which you can mm. install and use, although it says it's not supported. So it's there for you to try if you if you want Wayland's things. Yes, uh, I guess so. It's for yeah people to try out and see what you can and can't do with it. I expect, but nice. yeah, they, they just specifically say here's how to install it, but it's not there by default and it's not supported. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. It's it's no small feat as well that goes into Kubuntu. Um, the other day we were preparing some stats and metrics on things and we were looking at the number of packages that the different Ubuntu flavors are maintaining, you know, specific, specifically to deliver their um, their flavor. And mm. KD, KDE or Kubuntu is, I think, three times as many packages they maintain as the next biggest flavor in terms of package <laughs> maintenance. So wow. um, it's kind of a superhuman effort there from Rick and the rest yeah. of the team. Okay, Martin, what's going on in Ubuntu Budgie? So, yes, Ubuntu Budgie, uh, that is out w with its beta sporting the Budgie desktop 10.5.1, which uh, you can condense the Budgie release notes into all the bug fixes. It's a big, long list of bug fixes, paper cuts and improvements. So that's good to see. I'm sure that Ubuntu Budgie users will be very pleased to see that. Um, and there's been a bunch of effort around improving high DPI and 4K resolution support as well. Alan, Ubuntu chilling. That's something we mm. don't often hear about. Yeah, it's interesting. Whenever I'm testing the ISOs, and I did a whole bunch of testing of uh, each of these, chilling is the one that I leave till last. And the only reason I leave it till last is because I have to jump through slightly more hoops in order to get it to be in English than I do for <laughs> any of the others. Like all of the others, I could just put the USB key in, turn it on, and I know I'll get an English language desktop. But because the target market market for Ubuntu Chillin is China, obviously the default language and the default keyboard layout and the input methods and all that are all Chinese, Mandarin, you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I've only briefly tested it. It was the last one I looked at. But it's very pretty. It's very nice. Uh, and it uses their UK UI 3.0 desktop environment um, by default. Um, but it's it's very nice. It is very lovely looking. And if I if I had a bit more time, I, I would love to play with it a little bit more because it's the one mm. of all of the flavors that I've... It's probably the one I've used the least mm. simply because that, that whole Chinese by default kind of gets in the way for me. And I realize that's stupid because I can just choose English. It is possible to, to switch it to English. But because of that... I, I often don't look at it as deeply as I look at any of the others because it doesn't target me. So mm. um, 
Yeah, that's why. So Chilin's an interesting one for me because when they introduced UK UI, it was built on top of Mate Desktop and they Ah. forked a few components in order to take it in a different direction. And I know there's still some of the shared underpinnings because when I change stuff, I have to be careful about what I do because I can break their distro, which I have to be (laughs) cautious about. But when you load Chilin... There is no visual resemblance to Mate whatsoever. It looks very, very different. You wouldn't know there was any uh, shared an- ancestry there at all. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very quite pretty. impressive what they've done. Yeah, it's very nice. Speaking of Mate, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Ubuntu Mate uh, has a, a release coming up as well. And uh, new in Ubuntu Mate 2004 is version 1.24 of the Mate desktop. Uh, there's improved alt tab switching. What's improved? Uh, can, can you improve on alt tab switching? <laughs> uh, well, the, behav- the, the behavior is the same. You'll right. be pleased to, okay, you'll be good. Pleased to hear. But visually, ah, it looks, it looks uh, nice, very yeah. slick now. So it uses OSD overlays and things rather than right. old, crusty, yeah. you know, GTK widgets from yesteryear. Right. Um, and thumbnail preview. So this is where you've got something in the taskbar and you hover your mouse over and it shows you the window. Oh, nice. Indeed. Um, an optimized window manager for gaming. Yes. So Victor Carrera has been putting loads of effort into Marco over probably the last two years or so now. Uh, and he's been pursuing optimizing the compositor, uh, not just to eliminate screen tearing, but to reduce latency as much as possible. Uh, and it's measurably improved uh, performance when you're playing games uh, on Mate now. So um, is that is that the default window manager on Ubuntu Mate? It's default and the only window manager right. now. So we jettisoned Compiz and yep. Compton in 1910. You can still install them and use them yep. if you want to, but they're not shipped by default anymore. Interesting, because I'm actually running Ubuntu Mate on my Steam box. So uh, uh-huh. that will come Wise in very choice. handy. Checks in the post. <laughs> Ah, oh. um, Martin, what's in Ubuntu Studio? Even more audio plugins. <laughs> That's um, what you need. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's called Ubuntu Studio, so they're off, obviously delivering on the studio promise there. Um, I have to say, I have seen some people live streaming with Ubuntu Studio doing jack audio configuration, and I find it utterly bamboozling. <laughs> so I know it's got more of that, but I actually know nothing about how you hook that up or make it work. Um, but they have also had a return of My Paint as the default uh, graphics app mm-hmm. after solving some uh, library conflict issues. And Ubuntu Studio Controls, which is the tool that can do all of this fancy hooking up of Jack and, uh, you know, audio pipelines, that's been um, improved uh, oh, nice. and the interface has been simplified. You can do stuff with Jack Bridges, whatever that means. If anyone knows about Jack, that that's much better now. You can assign names to them and everything. You could say you don't know Jack. Oh. It is true. I should get a T-shirt with that printed on the back. Uh, Mark, tell us all about Zubuntu. Um, it's a voyage of discovery. <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Why is this? Uh, because they don't have release notes yet. So ah. install it and find out for yourself. Excellent. And I think that rounds up all of the Ubuntu flavors which are doing a 2004 release. So with that in mind, Alan, tell us about Ubuntu Testing Week. Yeah, we mentioned this uh, last time, I think, uh, and I, I said I'd set up a bot to hook up the Testing Week Telegram and IRC channel. Uh, Yusuf Phillips has, has mobilized an army of volunteers to test drive all those ISOs that we were just talking about, all the, the beta ISOs during Ubuntu Testing Week, week, which ran from the 2nd of April to the 8th of April. And a whole load of people turned up, some familiar faces from the Linux world, familiar faces from Linux podcasting and YouTubing and all that kind of stuff, who turned up and offered their services to try out their favorite flavor or go off piste and try a different flavor. And uh, basically just make sure all this stuff was as robust as possible in the beta so that we could identify the bugs before the release at the end of April. Mm. It was fantastic. It was really, really good. Really well organized and... Tons of people getting involved. It was really lovely to see 
uh, a good old school Ubuntu community, people getting together and working together towards a common goal um, in their spare time. It was fantastic. Really, really good. Really enjoyed it. Cool. And it's definitely paying dividends uh, in the nicest way possible. They made members of the desktop team cry today. <laughs> we had our weekly team meeting where we go through all of the bug reports to triage them. And usually there are some and there were pages of them. And we, we, <laughs> didn't, we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't get through them all. So we're scheduling another bug, tr bug triage meeting later this week in order to pick up where we left off from. But this is great because, you know, we're actually getting decent bug reports that we can work with and, you know, action and improve what will be the final release in... How, where, where are we now? Three weeks' time. So for all of the tears that were shed it's it, it was definitely a worthwhile endeavor because these are bugs that other people won't encounter when they install 2004 for the first time so thank you everyone that was involved in that effort it's much appreciated cool and we have a couple of events to mention uh, first up guardac 2020 this is the gnome developer conference which will now be a virtual online event it's happening from the 22nd to the 28th of july 2020 and also Academy, the KDE conference, will be online sometime around August, September of 2020. And while we're mentioning the GNOME and KDE developers, did either of you see the announcement about Core? No? Comb? Yeah, no. Gnome? Co Gnome. C Gnome. Yes. Gnome. There we go. That I was think a... K is silent. It's oh. Gnome. <laughs> I think we should argue about the name of this fictitious desktop environment. <laughs> yes. For those who didn't spot it, it was a April Fool uh, that was really nicely well done. It was um, nice and wholesome and uh, yeah, very well done and very friendly and uh, a nice collaboration between the KDE and GNOME developers. I really, I really enjoyed that. It was not like all these stupid gotcha kind of uh, April Fools, although I'm sure it did get a few people. It was. Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't see best. any rants about how bad an idea it was, so I think it was hopefully mostly taken as it was intended. Yep. All right, and that's all the community news and events for this week. And now it's time for the news. Alan, what did you find in the news this week? Well, Pharonix is reporting the March 2020 Steam survey results, which uh, piqued my interest because I got the pop-up this month ah. uh, asking me if I wanted to contribute to the Steam survey, which I always do whenever it yep. pops up. And I, I seem to get it quite a lot, and I don't have Steam open all the time. Uh, it's not like it's permanently open, so I'm more likely to get it. But I just happen to have it open uh, on my gaming laptop shall i say and mm -hmm. uh i thought oh yeah i'll go through it so i hit all the buttons but the Phoronix <laughs> article obviously links to the um the results of the survey and the results are in linux usage is up <gasps> yeah we're at the heady heights of <laughs> 0 0.87 percent wow yeah oh we've know, won right? yeah yeah, it's, Go home, it's, Microsoft. it's officially the year yep. of the Linux desktop. Your yep, goose is it. cooked, Microsoft. <laughs> um, 1804 is the most popular uh, distro, followed by 1910, obviously Ubuntu, uh, then followed by Manjaro and Arch and Linux Mint. And it doesn't list any more after that, but once okay. it gets down to 0 0.06%, uh, percent, um, yeah, they don't really go much below there. <laughs> Uh, by comparison, Windows has 86%. Windows 10 has 86% alone. And there's um, mm -hmm. obviously uh, a number of users on the Mac mm -hmm. more than we have. Ten times, I think, what we have. Right. Uh, so does it say how much general the general audience has grown? So forgetting, you know, Linux specifically, what, how has the Steam audience customer base grown in that period? I don't think it tells you. It's all it's all relative. Oh. It's all percentages. I don't see anything in here that are absolute numbers. It's mm. all just percentages. There might be numbers elsewhere, and I know there are third parties who scrape data from Steam mm -hmm. that use uh, like the SteamDB.info. Yeah. I think is one of the popular ones. Um, 
but the official Steam hardware survey is literally just a breakdown of comparative percentages, this versus that. Um, and one thing I did find interesting, I keep hearing from uh, people in the community how popular and how prevalent AMD GPUs are, and I totted up the percentages of each of the major gpus for the top 40 in the list i couldn't be bothered to do more because mm -hmm. it was just getting tedious but it was 60 percent of the top 40 video cards that were represented at the top 60 percent of them were nvidia 4.5 percent were amd and mm -hmm. six percent are intel yeah built in oh. video cards in laptops so people probably playing low-end games mm -hmm. uh you know not not triple a like big budget games on intel but still i found it fascinating that still nvidia has 10 times the market share of of amd and intel there are still more people playing on intel based gpus than there are playing on amd gpus which i thought was yeah. interesting hmm. yeah in ubuntu report i think um it's 60 percent because we're obviously just capturing the hardware um, you know, uh, manufacturer of the graphics card. And I think it's 60% is um, Intel, 20-something percent is NVIDIA, and the remainder is AMD at the moment for general mm. consumption. But AMD is trending up right now. Sure, it's trending up. But I yeah. what, what I get frustrated with is, is people complaining that the experience for AMD users is so terrible and there's so many of them. And this highlights the fact that there really aren't that mm -hmm. many of them they're, they're yeah maybe rising and they are just as valuable as customers as everybody else yeah. but it's not the significant player in the market but also uh, as as an amd user the experience on ubuntu is far from terrible these days oh you're too kind uh, we did cover this you should yes. go back and listen to uh, episode two where mark talks about his awesome experience um <laughs> Well done. Uh, and the final thing that I thought was uh, interesting is uh, 1080p is still the most popular primary display mm -hmm. resolution at 65%. Mm -hmm. And the second most popular resolution is good old 1366 by 768. I think it's all those <laughs> ThinkPad X220. Right that must be what it is. <laughs> and 10% is... 1440p. Yeah. that I mean, that is a common word. The 1366 by 768, that's a common you know, if you don't spend extra on a high-res display on a laptop, that's a pretty mm -hmm. common resolution. Yeah, general corporate laptop yeah. kind of resolution, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This, is, I, this is people playing games at work instead of doing their job. <laughs> <laughs> or on well, a plane, on a train, or, you know, when they're mobile in between. It doesn't necessarily mean it'd be at work, but because you may have... Well, mind you, this is the primary display, so they may have an external monitor. Ah, of there, course, yes. This, this is, is the true. primary one, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I thought that was all quite fascinating. It's nice yeah. to like dig in and speculate um, where these numbers come from and what they mean. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. What about you, uh, Mark? What did you find? Uh, well, I found a story which um, piqued my interest because uh, people are using 3D printers and open source hardware specs and making things that are actually useful. And I, I feel a bit like we're living in some sort of Cory Doctorow novel where this sort of thing supposedly happens. Um, Hang on a minute. I thought the whole point of 3D printers was to sort of print plastic gonks. <laughs> Yo Yodas and boats. No, no. The point of a 3D printer is to say that you have one and then you sit it in the corner of your room and you tell everyone you've got a 3D printer. <laughs> Yeah. Dear listeners, we're now all lurking at Alan's <laughs> webcam with the half-assembled 3D printer sat behind him. I think it's about 80% assembled. It's the power supply. I'm, the only reason it's not hooked up is because I'm really worried about this cheap Chinese power supply. And I worry that if I plug it in and then start printing something, it will burst into flames. <laughs> that's that's the only worry I have. I haven't. To, yeah. Anyway. Right. On. So what are they printing? Well, what's, what's been going printing, on? Mark? Um, they've been printing personal protective equipment for frontline workers to use in places like hospitals and pharmacies and ambulances. Um, and they've been printing uh, face shields. So um, the key bit that needs a 3D printer is a band of flexible plastic which goes around your head. And then that supports um, a clear plastic visor which covers your entire face. Um, and it turns out that 3D printers are very handy for making these um, when they might be in short supply otherwise. So there's um, various sort of initiatives which are doing this around the world. And there's a crowdfunder in the UK to raise funds to support their effort. 
um and in particular i think there's a um a czech company who have open sourced a design for these uh these masks uh, not quite masks sorry shields um so the, these aren't things to sort of filter your breathing but they're things to protect your face from like someone coughing at you or sneezing at mm-hmm. you or something like that um and yeah so this design is because it's open source it's being picked up by people and printed um in their sheds or garages or wherever they have a 3d printer now i've always been a little bit skeptical about these kind of things because when there's some world disaster or catastrophe all the tech bros jump out and say we can solve this with software or Mm. i've made an app that can fix this or you know the people with 3d printers will say i can 3d print a part that will fix that problem for you is it that or is it actually a useful thing that people use or is it just a bunch of plastic that's just going to (laughs) get chucked in the bin well this is one of the things which uh which made me think about it because yeah with something like this how do you know what's actually a useful thing to make right rather than just yeah downloading any old thing and and going for it and um by the looks of it the the design which um this particular campaign is using um has actually been developed um in association with the ministry of health in the czech republic um, and gone through various iterations with users to make sure that they're suitable and comfortable to wear and things like that and they very strongly encourage if you're going to make them talk to the people who are going to use them make sure they're actually going to be useful make sure that you're making them sort of clean and packaging them properly it's not just saying print these out and send them to your local hospital and hope for the best (laughs) they're yeah they're really like strong about making sure that you're going to make make it something useful for people with these that's pretty awesome so i guess we'll put a link in the show notes to where people can direct their printers i guess yeah and that's all the news for this week. And that's all for episode three. Thank you all very much for listening. Uh, next week, we're going to have a chat about the next generation of Linux phones and see what we think about them and uh, if things are going to be different this time around. Uh, If you want to get in touch with us uh, about anything we've spoken about or anything that you're thinking about, you can email show at ubuntupodcast.org. If you want to come and chat with us in between shows, you can join us in our Telegram group at ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram. And that's about it for this week. Thank you very much and adieu.